start. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, session dedicated to learning, uh, uh, imbalance learning and anomaly detection. Uh, the speaker will be Rémi Emonet from the Hubert Curie Laboratory uh, in Saint Etienne. Uh, I remind you that if you have uh, questions, you can use the chat. You can write down your your question directly, and uh, Rémi will take a, a moment in the in the middle of his presentation to to answer your question. You can also uh, directly uh, ask a question by raising your hand with the WebEx tool. And uh, okay, so let's start. I give the floor to to Rémi. Thank you, Mark. I remove this mask. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So today I'll be giving you a kind of course on the imbalance data. So learning from imbalance data and anomaly detection. So it will be mainly two big parts, national machine learning that you might have seen yesterday. And then we look at two different things two different ways uh, of uh, tackling this problem. And I will start by introducing this anyway. So if we come back to machine learning, uh, we can distinguish two things that you've seen previously already, uh, supervised and unsupervised machine learning. And the difference between the two is that with supervised machine learning, you have data points that you have here. And in addition to these data points, you have some kind, kind of labels. So here, a class, so you have the, the field points and the empty points. So you have the class and in an unsupervised learning problem, uh, what you have is only points and you don't have more information. You don't have the label, the thing that you want to actually predict. So in unsupervised learning, you will uh, have to do different things. In supervised learning, what you do typically, if it's for classification, you will find a, a decision boundary that tells you on one side of the, the boundary, it's one class and the other is the other class, but with unsupervised uh, uh, learning, what you'll have to do is to think about the data and try to understand the data in some way or make algorithms that will understand the data. So here, for example, we can group things together. Uh, I heard about k-means, for example, yesterday. So these points are usually, I mean, in what we are, we will consider mostly, I represent all the points in some space, vector space, uh, where you have, for, for example, here, three dimensions uh, or more dimensions, often it's flat on the screen. And here what I've drawn are not the axis, but it's the kind of decision boundary between the groups that we found uh, in an unsupervised manner. So without any labels, we found some groups and, uh, can separate them if we want. Uh, why I'm talking about this is because uh, most of the methods uh, for anomaly detection will fall in kind of these two categories, and this is the, the outline of my talk in some sense. We'll come back to this. So if I reformalize a little what you've seen yesterday, uh, in supervised learning, you have some input X and uh, the corresponding output Y, and you have a data set, so it's a set of input points with the corresponding output. And the goal is to learn, uh, I mean, to try to approximate the function uh, that uh, associate to an, a value of x uh, corresponding label. And the label, if you're doing classification, uh, is basically something that uh, if you have a binary classification, the label is 0 or 1 or minus 1 or 1, depending on how you encode it. But you, you can do a classification with uh, 10 classes and your label is the class index. But you can also have regression that is supervised also uh, from uh, some X inputs. You want to predict a Y value that is not a class, but a continuous value. For example, you want to predict uh, the life expectancy of some, uh, some patients uh, based on their medical records. And you have many methods here. I just listed some of them. I won't go into the detail, except for one that I will reuse later and that you've seen uh, in part yesterday, which is the k-nearest neighbors. But you have uh, different uh, algorithms here and that you can reuse. Uh, you, you've seen yesterday for some of them and you might see uh, them later for the other one. In unsupervised learning, you have just the data points. So it's mainly the same thing I've said before. And what you want to do with this, you cannot learn to predict the output because there is no given output. So what you will do 
something like clustering, density estimation, uh, source separation. Sometimes your own data that you observe are a mixture of some different things and you want to separate them. Uh, what you can do that we will see a little later is pattern mining, so finding some patterns in the data. And one of the, the tasks you might be interesting, interested in is anomaly detection, so without any labels, anomalies. And here in the unsupervised methods for the general uh, machine learning thing, you have a lot of things uh, that you've seen also some of them yesterday. I will just come back to KNN, so K nearest neighbor, because uh, it's a very simple uh, machine learning uh, method that is uh, very useful and that will be the base for part of my uh, for my talk later. So I will just try to illustrate what is KNN. It's very simple. You have a data set uh, with classes. So this works uh, with classes. So for example, you have crosses. But you also have uh, some another class, circles, red circles. And uh, what you do uh, when you do KNN is that for a new point that you observe, so you observe a point that is here, and you want to know its class. What is the class of this point here? And the k nearest neighbor will take k, nearest, k neighbors of this point and we'll consider uh, a kind of voting between these neighbors. So if k equals three, I will take the three nearest, oops. I will take the three nearest neighbors. Okay, sorry for this. It's three neighbors. So these three neighbors, two blue points, one red point. So if we want to predict for this point here, what we will do is to take the majority vote. So we take, and uh, the blue as the color when we want to predict this one. Okay, so. so this point that we will need to predict at this time will be predicted as blue because it has two blue neighbors and one red neighbors. So this method is very simple, but uh, it can be very useful and uh, very powerful because it has very good properties. Yes. Uh, okay, so now uh, let's talk about anomaly detection. Uh, and I'll do the same parallel with supervised and unsupervised anomaly detection. So with supervised anomaly detection, uh, what you have is basically a data set with some points and some are normal, let's say the, the field one, and some are abnormal, let's say the empty ones. But you also have unsupervised anomaly detection where uh, what you observe is only or mostly, depending on the case, anomal uh, normal points. So you don't have examples of anomalies. One very specific thing with anomalies is that it's very rare, usually, hopefully, if it's an anomaly. So uh, you don't have a lot of examples of it. So sometimes you just have normal examples and you want to predict, I mean, to be able to detect anomalies. So if you're in a supervised anomaly detection case, so where you have some examples of anomalies, then you can just treat it as a classification problem. And it will be uh, mostly the first part of my talk. And if you don't, the thing you can do is intuitively model what is uh, the distribution, so the repartition of the points, the normal points in your uh, input space. And for example, here I modeled it in this way. Uh, so we see that there are a lot of points around these two regions, and we suppose that uh, the actual uh, normal points, no, their number will decay when we go away from these uh, two clusters, let's say. So when you're in case of a supervised anomaly detection, when you get new points, so these three gray points here, uh, so maybe there are, uh, they look like the other anomalies, and it's good for these two points, but maybe they don't. So this one is really new. Uh, and in this case, it will be missed. Basically, we won't predict it as an anomaly because it's on the, the wrong side of the decision boundary. Uh, when you do unsupervised anomaly detection, you model the normal points. So anything that is far 
from these normal points will be considered as an anomaly. So, for example, we can say that after this second line here, which is the same as this one, anything outside this is an anomaly. So, if we observe the same anomaly that we observed here, we see that they will fall outside. So, here obviously I took an example that is very convenient. Uh, and this case is kind of perfect for unsupervised, but uh, generally the unsupervised case is more complex, more difficult than the supervised one. So these two things will be basically the two parts I will be covering today. So some disclaimers before we actually dive into this. Uh, so there is some bibliographic uh, references in this, uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, but it's not exhaustive, so basically uh, it's some papers that I point, and uh, by looking at the references in these papers, you can get basically more information about the state of the art and uh, all the uh, intricate uh, relation between the different things. Um, the presentation is not exhaustive. Uh, I don't have the time to actually uh, cover everything, so I selected a few things, and I will dive into some details of these few things. Uh, I also put some scary things in the in the slides, so there is a lot of details in some slides, but I will skip through uh, most of the details in this complex slide. Uh, so don't hesitate if you have questions or anything, I can detail, that's why I kept uh, contents there. So before diving into my two sections, I will just uh, consider one thing is uh, why anomaly detection in machine learning is different from traditional machine learning. So just a few uh, possible applications uh, that we can have uh, for anomaly detection. Uh, I take examples that I will reuse later in this presentation. So for example, you want to detect from uh, some video streams that you're filming somewhere, some anomalies, some unsafe situations, for example, that might go occur, somebody falling uh, in a public space or something like this. Uh, you might want also to detect defects in images. So you have images of, uh, of goods or of products and you want to detect some defects inside them. Uh, so this is a kind of anomaly detection problem. Uh, so or another, another example on which we're working is uh, detecting abnormal uh, heartbeat in uh, ECG. Another kind of uh, kind of anomaly, so that falls in the same kind of problems in machine learning is fraud detection, uh, which is slightly different because it's a kind of active anomaly. So people are trying to fool your system. But uh, for example, we've been working with fraudulent uh, checks, uh, credit cards, or uh, financial frauds also. Companies that try to not pay their, their... Yes, okay, sorry. Uh, so why is it different, all these things? Uh, because uh, we are basically in a situation where we want to do classification. So we want to detect what is an anomaly and what is not an anomaly. Uh, but the very specific case is that the positive class, so what we call the positive class is the anomaly class, what we want to detect. Uh, usually it's in minority. So sorry for the terms, but it's the one we use. So the positive class is in minority, the negative class is in majority. Um, and basically the positive class is what we have uh, to detect like rare events, anomalies, frauds, things like this. The negative class is anything that is normal. So to better understand the specificity, we need to consider the, the kind of errors that uh, um, a model can do. So, uh, and all this is summarized in what we call a confusion matrix. And uh, there is this concept of true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative. So what we have to understand is that if we have a data set with some positive instances and negative instances, positive would be the anomalies, there are less of them. Uh, and we have a model that predicts some of the instances as being uh, anomalies. So we, what we call the predictive, predicted positive, so which will be in reference to, uh, reference to this positive. So uh, the predicted positive, it's this. 
So then the true positive is whatever the model predicted as positive and is actually positive. The false positive is what the model predicted as positive and is not actually positive and so on. So if I manage to get back there. So I annotated here on the picture. So the true positive is what is correctly predicted as positive. The true negative is what is correctly predicted as negative, hence the true. And uh, you have the false negative, the things that you predicted as negative. So it's the missed detection. So you missed some uh, alarms, some frauds, some anomalies. And the false positive is the false alarms. So it's the false, the things that you detected as uh, an anomaly, but it's not an anomaly. And from this uh, very basic uh, measures that measure the quality of a prediction with respect to the ground truth, uh, we can define, we define usually a lot of measures, but I will focus on some of them. The precision, which is basically uh, how precise your system is when it gives an anomaly. So it's among the alarms, the anomalies that are detected by your system, how many are actually uh, true alarms? So it's a true positive divided by the true positive plus the false positive. So the true positive divided by all the alarms. You have this in the picture also. The recall is how much of the actual anomalies your system is able to find. So it's the actual found anomalies divided by the total number of anomalies. TP plus FN, TP plus FN is basically all the possible, I mean, all the, I mean, all the, the anomalies. And there is basically a trade-off between these two because it's very easy to have a very good precision. You just have to predict mostly nothing. Only when you're sure you predict an anomaly. Uh, so every time you will predict something, you will actually be right. It's an anomaly, but uh, you will miss most of the anomalies. And, uh, at the opposite, the recall is easy to maximize. You just predict everything as anomalies and uh, you get the perfect recall. That's why there is a measure that is called the uh, F beta measure. So it's a family of measure. Beta is just a constant that you select based on the application. And it's a compromise between precision and recall and it will be very low if the model is very bad. So it has very bad precision or bad recall because of the product, if one of them is, uh, is bad, uh, the F beta measure will be bad. So this is a reminder of the previous slide, and uh, it's to insist on why we use these measures and not the accuracy. The accuracy, if I reformulate it uh, in terms of uh, what we've said before, is the true positive plus the true negative divided by the total number of examples. It's uh, the measure that you often uh, optimize when you're doing uh, classification in machine learning. But the F beta measure, it's a compromise between precision and recall. So the accuracy is actually not very good when you're in the case of anomaly detection because uh, in anomaly detection, you have much more uh, normal example than abnormal example. So for example, I take positive as 100 points and the negative has 10,000 points. So you have much more normal points. Uh, so when you try to optimize the accuracy, I would say that the classifier that always says the point is normal will be not that bad because the true positive will be zero. Uh, the true negative will be the number of negative. So you say, you say that everything is, uh, sorry, everything is normal, so you get all the normal, you get none of the positives, so the abnormalities. Uh, said differently, your errors, you don't make any false positive because you don't say anything is an alarm, but you capture all the negative properly. So it's a case where you have a very stupid classifier, basically, that says always the same thing without even looking at the point. Uh, so here is an example. You have uh, 10,000 green points, normal points, uh, 100 blue points. Your classifier is here, anywhere, basically. 
and it, I mean, anywhere outside of the point cloud, and it says, it says uh, everything on this side is green. So it says basically everything is green. In terms of accuracy, if we do the, the plain computation, uh, basically it will be okay on all the green points and wrong on all the blue points. But if we make the computation, uh, given that our uh, basically 100 more uh, negative points, so two point, uh, green points, we'll reach a very good accuracy of 99%, which if we don't look closely, might uh, let us think that we are doing something actually meaningful. While uh, this looks very good, but in practice, it's a very useless classifier that always says the same thing. If we do it in F beta measure, uh, what we will compute basically uh, is the product between precision and recall. The precision is very high. I mean, it's not totally defined, but it's very high here. But the recall, the number, I mean, the proportion of anomalies that we actually detect as anomalies is zero. We never detect an anomaly. So this measure will give us a zero, which is very bad. It means the measure tells us that the model is very bad, which is totally right because the model is totally useless. It's totally constant and predicting the same thing for everything. So when we do anomaly detection, or more generally, when there is an imbalance like here, uh, in F beta measure, it's much more interesting than the accuracy to evaluate the model and also, if we can, to actually learn a model. The challenges uh, with the F beta measure uh, are various, but uh, the one that was specific is that it's non separable, which means that uh, if we have like this uh, one, I mean, 10,000 points, we cannot optimize independently for each point, basically. Said differently, the F beta measure is not separating as a sum over all the points. So we cannot uh, do things that we do uh, when we just optimize the accuracy, which is separable. And this brings me to uh, my first uh, big part, which will be the biggest probably. Uh, and to intrude to, I mean, this slide I will put back uh, to remind you of where we are. So, when you're doing anomaly detection, you can have either a supervised learning problem. You have some anomalies, but it's only a few of them. So we are in the case of mass imbalance and sometimes a very high imbalance, like one, example, one positive example for 10,000 negative ones or things like this. Or we can be in an unsupervised scenario where we don't have any labels. So we don't have examples of anomalies and basically our goal is to detect what is novel, so to learn what is normal and to detect anything that is abnormal, anomalous, or novel. We we'll start with this first part where we have a class imbalance scenario. So here I will uh, present a few generic approaches. Then I will dive into some uh, works that we, we've been doing actually. Uh, and uh, on this, uh, there are three very distinct, distinct work, and I will focus on two of them. So we are in a classification scenario with imbalance data, so which means that one class is much more represented than, represented than the other uh, in the training set. So uh, we have a strong majority of negative examples of so normal points. So a very simple yet uh, applied uh, technique that is uh, used is to say, okay, if I have uh, more, like, let's say, let's make it simple, twice more negative examples, I will just take half of them randomly and uh, I will learn from this. So I rebalance my data set by undersampling, so by removing some points of the majority class. We throw away some points, so it's kind of, uh, of sad in some sense. We just throw away some information to, to fix a problem. Uh, another uh, strategy, which is uh, slightly similar, uh, it's to oversample the positive class. So depending on what we are doing, uh, the only thing we can do is to just duplicate some points. If we have twice less anomalies as normal points, we just duplicate all anomalies and we learn from that and uh, it kind of fixes the imbalance. So it's not very, I mean, it's like the first one, it's not very satisfying. Uh, there are more uh, 
advanced approaches that will try to generate new anomalies, basically. And to do this, uh, one very well-known uh, approach is called SMODE, uh, which will try, basically, to generate points between two other anomaly points. I'll try to illustrate this quickly. So in SMODE, if you have anomalies like this, and normal points, yes. So SMOT, what it will do is to take basically some, okay, some lines between normal points and generate some points here. So it will try to fill in the space. So we're saying that basically if uh, whatever is in the convex, uh, convex uh, of different Right here also. So we can generate new points. So we fix the imbalance by creating some information. So sometimes it works very well when it uh, geometrically makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't, but uh, this is a very effective method. Uh, another solution would be to generate around existing points. And to generate around this existing point, we could generate really around. So all these methods are very good uh, when they make sense, so ge geometrically. Uh, but sometimes it's difficult to define what is the around because uh, here it's in two dimension, so it's very easy to see what is around. Uh, I won't tell this, but when you are in high dimension, it's very difficult to know what is actually the neighborhood of the point. Okay, so this is Okay, and another uh, kind of a uh, class of, of methods is to say, okay, my, my two first points here are not very good because they try to fight the imbalance by throwing away points or duplicating points. Why not try to use a method that directly allows to weigh the points? So this point will count twice as much or 3.5 as much as another point and so on. So it's what we call the balance. I mean, one of these is the balanced accuracy when we compensate the points so that each class has the same importance. Uh, one challenge, and uh, we'll come back to this, is that the optimal weight, so how to balance the class, is not known actually. And it's not just saying, okay, we'll have each class that is worth half, so half-half we have the binary classification. Uh, it's more complex than this actually. So it's what we'll see here. Uh, the first method, and uh, that improves over K and N, K nearest neighbors that I represented at the beginning of my talk. And uh, to make it better for imbalanced scenarios. So this is the paper uh, that I will be mainly talking about. So it's actually two papers. Uh, it's how to adjust a nearest neighbor algorithm to maximize the F measure in case of imbalanced data. So everything is here in the title. So KNN, uh, just a reminder, I won't tell it. Uh, it's exactly what I've done before. You have a new point to test. You will look at your training set. You didn't learn anything. You just remember all the points. You look at the closest points if K equals three. You look at three points if K equals five. You look at five points and so on. And uh, you do a voting to actually define uh, what you will predict. Uh, there are, it's, Used a lot, so there are very efficient algorithms that actually work for this. And uh, it might seem like a very old method, but uh, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I won't exactly dive into the details here, but it's still used a lot. Uh, so if we look at KNN for imbalanced data, uh, what we will have is that, uh, I mean, there are two regions of the space, two, two kind of uh, of boundaries between classes that might be of interest. And the first is what I call uncertain areas. So it means that in some region of your feature space, uh, you have some, I mean, the two class, if we are binary classification, the two class are possible. And uh, what we want to do is to have a classifier that in this region predicts, uh, I mean, predict roughly uh, the proportion, the actual proportion of the two classes. So if some images, uh, for example, are 
ambiguous in some sense, but it's twice as likely that it's a cat than a dog if you're classifying cat and dogs. Uh, then what we want to do is a classifier that predicts uh, either 66% uh, of cat or that predicts randomly and 66% of its prediction will be a cat. Uh, what we know, I mean, we can prove easily, is that 1NN, so the KNN with K equal 1, uh, respects this imbalance. Uh, it's not the case for uh, other keys, or other values of K. Uh, so what we will try to fix, it's not the case, but it's not necessarily a big issue in some sense, but uh, what we are mostly trying to think, fix is KNN behavior at the boundaries. So when we are between two classes, so there is not a class overlap, but we are between two classes. So you can imagine that the space is very complex and intricate, but at some location, the two classes are close together in the future space, and we want to study what happens here. Uh, what we will see in the next slide is that the sampling effect, so the fact that there are few points that we observe, makes the imbalance a problem. So in theory, if we have an infinity of points, there is no problem, but uh, given that we are sampling, so we have only a subset of points, there is an actual problem. So what I've drawn here is on the left some 1,000 positive, let's say, anomaly points, and on the right, 10,000 negative points, so normal points. And what you see here is basically a zoom in the location of the space where the two, uh, the two classes are close to each other. So here what we see is basically a boundary between two classes, but the space in its uh, generality might be much more complex, but it's a very zoomed in uh, space where we observe uh, what happens at the boundary. Uh, the gray area is a region where there is no point. So we suppose that there is no ambiguity. The classes are well separated in uh, the real uh, data. And uh, what we try to learn is a thing that will separate this minority class from this majority class. And if we just learn a one and n, what we learn is this, uh, this dark boundary here. So we see that it, it falls mostly in the gray area. So it means that it's perfectly predicting for all the points, even uh, for future points that we might observe either on either side. So I take the same case, exactly the same case, but from 1,000, I went down to 100, and I kept the same proportion. So there are always 10 times more normal examples than abnormal examples. And what we see is now that the boundary that is drawn from the set of points tends to go to the left. So we tend to lose some space here and here. Uh, some space that actually uh, will be wrongly classified. If I happen to observe an anomaly here, here, then I will wrongly classify it as something normal. And if I go on and say, okay, so this again, it's a zoomed in version of a very specific part of the region, yeah. of the space. So you won't have that many points. So if I go even lower in terms of points, still the same ratio, so 10 points on the left, 100 on the right, you see that this region where we start to be wrong here uh, becomes bigger and bigger. So what we see from this example but we, that we can prove is that 1NN or even ANN as we may see, uh, fails at actually, uh, I mean, at uh, handling this uh, imbalance in case where we have only a few data points. So you might wonder what happens if we increase K. So this is the same example as before, K equal one, with uh, some points, less points, still the same ratio, 10 times more normal points. But it's worse, it's exactly the previous slides. Now, if I increase K to 11, for example, what we see is that it becomes even worse. Basically, increasing K makes this problem even worse. And we see it here a lot. Uh, obviously, uh, when we take K equal 11 to be predicted as an anomaly, you have to have six 
anomalous points in your neighborhood. If there are only 10 anomalous points, it will become very difficult to have uh, six anomaly points. And it's only this region that will predict, be predicted as an anomaly. So increasing K doesn't help, which uh, in some sense is good because uh, K equal one has some better properties already for the other, other property of interest. So what we try to do is to fix this problem. Not necessarily with, with this k, but with k equal one, we try to fix this. So this uh, this uh, this paper that I mentioned before uh, tries to do that, and how it does it, uh, it looks at what you have as one and n. So one and n, if you have normal point in red here everywhere, and some abnormal point in blue, uh, what I've drawn here is the decision boundary. So it's called the Voronoi re uh, regions here because it's based on the, the nearest neighbor. So the thing that is nearest to the blue point will be predicted as blue. And as soon as you're closer to a red point, you'll be predicted as normal. So here we have a few anomalies. And this is uh, uh, the traditional one nearest neighbor. So what we do is basically uh, extend, we kind of extend this, and we call it gamma, gamma NN. And basically what it does is try to expand the boundaries around I mean, to push boundaries from the blue point. So here we see that uh, when we vary our gamma parameter, uh, we see that the, the blue region extends. And uh, if we push it uh, a little too much, what we start to see is that actually what we are doing is not pushing, I mean, not extending the boundary out from the blue points, but more surrounding the red points. So we are kind of going back to learning normality here, but using some abnormal example as a, as a basis. So what we wanted to do is to push these boundaries. And the first uh, thing we wanted to actually do, to be honest, was to uh, generate some pluses around the existing ones. So make a new method for oversampling, so for generating new points. Uh, we tried to use generative adversarial networks for this, and it happened that it was very unstable. So we moved to something more, uh, more well-founded, and uh, that's why uh, we ended up with this approach. Uh, so what we will do is basically artificially make the plus, so the abnormalities, closer to new points. So when we look at the nearest neighbors, we'll be artificially closer to a new point. So uh, what we will do is to have a gamma parameter uh, that we will use. And intuitively, if gamma is below one, it means that the plus is a rare class and that we want to uh, basically virtually increase uh, its, uh, its effect in, this, in its neighborhood. And the very simple formulation of this is that the actual distance that we will use to consider the nearest neighbor is either the traditional Euclidean distance where we are talking about uh, negative points. So for when we are trying to know if we are close to a red point, we use the normal distance. But if we are trying to know uh, if we are close to a blue point, we use gamma times this normal distance, this Euclidean distance, so which means that gamma being lower than one, in most cases, uh, we are artificially reducing the distance. So we are increasing the influence of the, the, abnormal, the anomalies. So here is an example with just two points, one positive instance, one negative normal point. Sorry. So here you have the boundary for the one and n, so the, it's basically uh, in the middle. Uh, if we use gamma nn equal one, we end up with the same boundary. By definition, it's the same. And if we use gamma equal 0 0.8, we are actually artificially bringing all points closer to this one. So it means that the point that is here, I don't know what I did. Sorry. Okay. So the point that is here uh, will be artificially closer to this one than to this one. So this is the new boundary with point eight. With point six, it's even closer, point four even closer, and so on. 
uh, gamma can be greater than one. We want to do the opposite. So uh, here it's with gamma equal two. So basically this gamma equal two is the symmetric of uh, 0 0.5. So it's like one over gamma that symmetrizes the thing. So here we have uh, some different examples just to, to check that it's making sense. Uh, so if we have a lot of points and just two uh, anomalies, same thing in, in the thick black thing here, you have the one and n, and when you lower gamma, you're basically pushing the boundaries. And here you are doing the same, just in a different uh, situation. What we can see is that if we have gamma that becomes very low, or even if not, if we zoom out, uh, we see that we can really have some things that are considered as anomaly, even though they are in the middle of normal points. They are in the middle, but not so close, so uh, they are considered as anomaly. So without detailing this, uh, this algorithm is trivial to implement. Uh, basically, you run two k and n, one on your negative uh, samples, one on your positive samples. Then you merge the list of neighbors, uh, but you merge them based on this gamma distance that you update. So it has the same complexity of k as k and n, basically twice its complexity uh, at the worst. Uh, and uh, so it can benefit also from all the optimization that exists and the approximation that might exist for KNN. There is no training as in KNN, so it's basically you remember by heart uh, the training set. And uh, the question might be how we select gamma, and gamma can be selected uh, basically by validation, so using a validation set uh, on the measure of interest. So this is a uh, a way of selecting uh, the gamma parameter that best fits our problem. So if I summarize this uh, gamma and n contribution and approach, uh, in uncertain region uh, that we had here, so we've uh, always here 10 points on the left, 100 on the right, 100, 1000, so always the same imbalance. So we see the effect uh, of varying gamma, and we see that gamma actually pushes the boundary. Uh, what we see is that there is no one value that could fit perfectly. That's why uh, we need to actually tune the gamma parameters. But this tuning can be done uh, easily and on the measure of interest, not the accuracy, but uh, for example, the F measure or things like this. So I will skip this, but basically it works. It works better uh, in average than uh, the other methods. That existed. And uh, this one is interesting, but I will skip most of it. But uh, what you find back here is smote, uh, the thing that creates point anomalies in the line between two existing anomalies. And this can be very well combined with uh, our gamma, gamma KNN approach. And actually, uh, it really combines very well and works uh, better than anything else. One thing we might not be uh, well, uh, well, I mean, that we might not like is this fact that we select gamma uh, using a validation pro procedure. Um, and so, uh, so there is a question, sorry, I did it. Yeah, the reasoning of all this, I plot most of the things uh, on, on on 2D because it's a flat screen, but um, yeah, the disclaimer is that all this works in higher dimension, so 3D, 4D, whatever, sometimes 100 dimension, but uh, also that some of the methods, including KNN, but most of the methods have problems with very high dimension. So it's not necessarily very meaningful to do a KNN in, I don't know, 10,000 dimensions. So in 2D, 3Ds, 100D, I would say it's okay. A 10,000 dimension uh, KNN is not a good idea. So what, what to, we can say is that we, in this approach, what we don't like is this selection of gamma that might be a little, uh, I mean, not complex, but uh, it necessitates that we use a validation set. So uh, something that we don't use to learn, but that we use to just decide what uh, gamma value is good for our problem. Um, 
So one thing that uh, we've proposed is to actually do some what we call metric learning uh, to, to actually uh, not use this validation set, uh, but to really learn uh, this gamma in some sense. And at the same time, we make, make the approach uh, more flexible also. So this is uh, what it, it yielded. So, uh, so it's another algorithm that is called MLFP. Don't have it here, but uh, it's uh, metric learning from few positive. <clears throat> uh, and what it does basically, it's instead of selecting the best gamma, it will learn a metric, so a matrix that distorts the space basically. So instead of seeing uh, our points as having a, a spherical or a circular influence around it, it will learn kind of the, the deformation of the space. So maybe you, you heard about metric learning a little at some point, either yesterday or before, uh, but I cannot really focus on this. <clears throat> uh, but one good thing is that we can derive an algorithm that actually learns. So it's not just we try different gamma values and select the best, even if it's very fast, uh, we don't do it this way. Uh, with uh, this metric learning algorithm, we can actually learn this. Uh, something that I won't detail for sure is that uh, we also derive theoretical guarantees that this algorithm actually makes sense and uh, gives uh, meaningful, meaningful results. So here uh, are two things, an illustration of what we're doing. Uh, basically, you have here uh, some normal instances, some abnormal one, and instead of just learning the gamma value, so the thing that uh, controls uh, the distance of influence of our positive thing, we will learn also the shape of the data. So when we compare a new point to uh, a normal point, we just use the Euclidean distance, like we were doing in ga gamma KNN. But when we compare a new point to an anomaly, what we will do is actually use this matrix M that is learned and that will uh, distort the space basically. So here we see that it's in this axis that uh, we have anomalies. So the M matrix will learn this direction and will make these points closer. Uh, but the point that would be here, that would be blue, will not be considered closed compared to this red point. So it's a way of distorting the space uh, that works actually um, pretty well to actually learn uh, this, yeah, with a learning algorithm. So here, uh, I just, I won't detail this for sure. Uh, I just put uh, the optimization problem that we actually uh, posed and that we solve and that we use to actually find the best M. So the optimization problem is minimizing over M. So it's finding the best M. So this is learned by optimization. So this part, I will uh, introduce it quickly and I will skip most of the details. And then I will focus back on the next part, which is uh, very different. It's still about uh, imbalance problem, about F measure, but it's very different from gamma KNN. Uh, this I will skip mostly. Uh, it's, um, it's a set of work uh, and the slide I took here are borrowed from a PhD defense presentation by Guillaume Metzler. So intuitively, uh, it's an algorithm that says, okay, we are seeing the same problem with imbalance classification, where you have a lot of normal points. Colors are not exactly the same here, but the normal points are in blue this time, and the abnormal points are in red. So the idea is that it's for a very imbalanced, highly imbalanced classification scenario, where you have very, very, very few uh, red points compared to blue points. For example, one for uh, 100,000 or something like that. So what you have to do is to basically find a way to use the most you can all the, the, the anomalies you have. And this is an example where you, you worked on the fraud detection. So it's basically you try to learn as much as you can from the, the frauds. 
So the, the matrix in the previous work is actually uh, the same everywhere, uh, but uh, we could have adapted it actually, but we didn't. Uh, we could, it was in the future work, but in the end, we never did it. So the idea here is also to learn a metric. Uh, this brings, uh, I mean, this is uh, well aligned with the, the question. So uh, in the previous work that I presented, we didn't, we learned a single metric basically for the whole space, but here we have very few positives. So what we will try to learn is learn a metric, but very locally. So for every positive point, for every fraud, every abnormality that we have, we will learn the shape of the space around it. So basically for this point, we will try to learn the ellipse and it can be in uh, more than two dimension. There is a generalization of an ellipse in more than two dimensions. And we will try to find maximum uh, excluding ellipse. So the maximum ellipse that we can fit around this red point without touching blue points or without touching too many blue points. And so this will be learned for every point uh, with the hope to actually capture as much as we can around existing anomalies. So if somebody flooded in some way, uh, we will try to learn uh, how to, to actually uh, detect the fraud differently and detect some frauds that are similar, but that are not reaching some things that are normal. Normal. Yeah. So I will skip the details. I, I put them because I will give you the slides uh, if you want details, but it works. Uh, but still, there are some issues in the sense that uh, if there are frauds that are novel, totally novel, so not, that are not close to an existing fraud, we won't be able to detect it uh, with this way. While gamma KNN uh, could be able to actually detect things uh, in this kind of regions here. Uh, but, uh, this approach is better locally, but uh, globally it's slightly uh, less powerful in the sense uh, that it cannot detect. It doesn't mean it works as well because uh, it's still a very highly imbalanced and difficult case here. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, here we'll move to slightly something slightly different where we will focus on optimizing the F measure. So we are still in a classification problem with imbalance, but we will focus on optimizing the F measure. And uh, at the end, I will do uh, what I can on this last part uh, with the time that I have. But uh, what is important is that you clearly get the picture that there are two kinds of approaches. Uh, in the second category, they will be more difficult. So, I mean, there is a lot of variety and they are kind of more tricky to, to cover. So it's not, it's okay if uh, I don't cover fully the second part. So don't hesitate to ask questions. We'll move on to this, but ask questions if you have. So we are back here to the F beta measure. So we are focusing on this now. Uh, so I put back some, uh, some definitions here uh, with a color code. So the first positives are the thing that we predict as positive. Our model declares it's an alarm, an abnormality, and uh, something novel, but it's false. So it means that our model is wrong. And uh, basically we are considering the two kinds of errors here, the false positive and the false negatives. And, uh, and uh, I put back the definition of precision and recall. Uh, and I added something here that is the, the true positive. So the actual correct prediction of our model is equal to the total number of uh, positives, so the total number of abnormalities, anomalies that there should have been, minus the false negative, so the thing that we predicted as negative while they were positive. Why I put this is because actually TP depends on our false negatives, so on some of the errors. So even if it's not colored in red, it's actually depending on uh, the red uh, value. So again, one of the most important challenge of the F-beta measure is that it's non-separable. So we cannot optimize it traditionally, like we do for most, uh, I mean, many of the, the measure like the accuracy. 
So here it's the full re re rewriting of uh, the F1 measure. So it's what we call the F1 score or the F score. So it's one value of the beta measure. Yeah, so the beta, the, the beta in the F beta measure, it's a parameter here. Uh, so it's not easy to, to see, I mean, without uh, spending some time, but uh, basically it's a trade-off between precision and recall. It controls how much we want to favor precision. So how good, I mean, how much we can trust our system when it says it's an abnormality and how much we uh, favor recall. So it means what part of the actual abnormality our system detects. And this is uh, a compromise between the two. And actually with this uh, trick here, uh, the beta controls how much we want to favor precision or recall. It's a compromise all the time, but uh, with different uh, contexts. So here I rewrite everything, but basically I take the definition of precision and recall. I replace by uh, the definition of, uh, I mean, that we have, and I rewrite it. So here I put everything, but the bottom line is that, so here it's with beta equal one, because it's simpler. It avoids uh, having uh, one plus beta square everywhere. Uh, but the F1 score in the end is equal to this. And the P is constant, it's uh, some property of the data set. It's the number of anomalies in our data set. And these things are the errors. And when we learn something, we want to minimize the errors. But minimizing this ratio of errors is not easy. That's why, I mean, it's because this ratio of errors actually in the end is not separable, but it's not easy to optimize. But what we can observe, what I observed here, is that, is that the F1 is equal to A over B. So it's a ratio between two things, and these two things are these two things here. So the trick, the very important trick here is to say, there is a link between optimizing the F1 score and some weighted classification. Weighted classification is when you optimize a, a traditional accuracy. So if you were wrong for a point, then you lose one, one, one. If you're wrong for another point, you lose one and so on. But it's weighted in the sense that some class uh, cost more. If you're wrong on an anomaly, you lose 10, for example. If you're wrong on a normal point, you lose one. So this is weighted classification. And there is a trick that will be fully detailed in the next slide, the case of the F beta measure. But I will give you the trick here intuitively. So we have the F1 is equal to A over B. So I can rewrite So I can say, I can say something like this. So can I, can I have the F1 that is greater than 0 0.65? I ask myself this question. And having the F1 greater than 0 0.65, I took an arbitrary value. So the F1 is between zero and one actually, or any F beta is between zero and one. And this is basically, do I have A over B? I mean, can I have A over B greater than 0 0.65? So it's the same problem. And where it gets interesting, it's that I can rewrite it as A greater than 0 0.65 B, same problem. And this I can rewrite as A minus 0 0.65 B greater than zero. And this A minus 0 0.65 B is this minus 0 0.65 the denominator. And it's actually if we rewrite it fully, it's actually uh, 
a weighted classification that weights differently the false positive and the false negative. So if we ask for a particular value is, I mean, am I able to make F1 greater than this value? I can answer this question by answering a weighted classification question. Can I make this error lower than this value? And this is very the, the trick, the intuitive trick behind uh, the works that uh, I will be detailing a little more just now. So I will move to the next slide. So this next slide is exactly the same, uh, but with uh, F beta in general and uh, some uh, technical term that tells you that uh, what we had uh, in the previous slide, A over B is actually what we call the linear fractional measure. And uh, so it also tells you that what we've done uh, actually work for anything that is called linear fractional. So not only the F beta measure, but something else. So here it's the exact derivation of what I've written before in the case of F beta. And what we have in the end is here that we have some weights between the two kind of errors. So my 0 0.65, I called it T. So we have some weights between the two kind of errors. So by recombining uh, the numerator and the denominator and uh, this weight, so it's not greater than compared to what I had in the previous slide, but it's lower than, and there is a constant here. So this is actually a constant uh, that depends only on the number of positive. So our imbalance classification problem becomes this one. So what we call the class weight is this, it's called A of T, but it's equal to this. So there are really two values. For each class, there is a different weight. So intuitively, what we use is this trick. We were not the first one to actually use this, but we used it in a, in a nice way. So I will present uh, basically this work. But really, the important part is this trick. So if our F beta measure, I mean, if we ask the question whether we can make the F beta measure greater than a given value, then we can reformulate this question as, can we uh, have a class, a weighted uh, classification accuracy, so this value here, that is actually lower than some value. So can we find a good uh, weighted classification accuracy? And the weights are defined by these uh, terms that we derive here. So this is a previous paper that existed. Uh, so the main reason that they use is basically they use this intuition uh, and uh, they say that uh, given a value of T uh, and you have the class weights that we've seen before, given a weighted classification learner, so something that is able to solve a weighted classification learning problem, then and they derive a lot of uh, mathematics there to actually prove that it's true then the optimal F measure that you can obtain is not too far from the one that you obtained by learning your weighted classification accuracy. And they conclude they conclude by saying that Basically, if you try sufficiently enough values of T, so T should be between zero and two actually, but if you try sufficiently many values, then you will end up something that is close to the optimal. So you try a lot of values of T and then uh, you get, uh, you, I mean, you keep the best F measure that you actually obtain by learning weighted classification learner. And then by doing this, you get something that is uh, close to the optimal. And in the experiment, they decide that they will take 19 values of T. Basically, they do a grid search. They search for the, the values of T on a grid. So they test different values of T and uh, they test 19 values of T. 
So in our uh, work that uh, be, that was basically uh, revisiting this work, uh, what we did is to add a geometric interpretation of what they were doing. Uh, consequently, showing that what they were doing actually uh, made, made no sense with uh, 19 values of T. Uh, we showed that they are bound that they used to actually decide on the optimality was not very good. We improved it a lot. So we derived uh, tight bounds on uh, predicting basically what will happen if I change the value of T. I tried with a given value of T, I would change a little. If I change a little, what would happen? Uh, and we use this bound to derive an algorithm. So I had the demo, but uh, we use the slides because it would be more convenient. Uh, so I will skip the details, but uh, if we plot here on a T axis, so we try with a given value of T, we learn a model uh, by reweighting the two classes. So based on this A of T, so the, the weights that we, we found before. So if T equal one, for example, we will learn a model with equal weight for both classes, because it's easy to, to see if T equals one. Um, and this model will give us some actual F measure. So we can learn a model using the accuracy, observe the F measure it has, and basically what they did with their bounds in the previous paper was to say, and this is where we added an interpretation, there is a cone of F values that are unreachable. So my T was here or here, I mean, my F was here, uh, if I change a little t, if I go here on the right, then I cannot reach more than this line here. I cannot find a very good f measure uh, that is close to, uh, I mean, using uh, some weights that are close to this t. So we interpreted this and we plotted it in some data set, but it's the same on most data sets. Uh, with their strategy, which was to use 19 values of T. So if you use 19 values of T, so you see the 19 different models learned with 19 different weights for the two classes and the corresponding F measure. What we see is that often the, the model is very bad, actually. It's actually predicting something trivial and the F measure is zero because the, the recall is zero. And uh, in these 19 models, we drew the cones, so the region that cannot be reached. But what we see here is that, okay, if I move a little away from this T value here, I cannot go too high. But if I move just between the two values of T, I can still reach a perfect F measure because there is still a white barrier here, which means that uh, the, the See the bound. So the bound that they, they derived is this cone here that interpreted geometrically. So the bound is not very good because with 19 values of T, we still don't know. We still think that we could find here, here, everywhere uh, some perfect models. So basically the bound is not telling us much. So the optimal F measure might well be one still, even if we've done 19 models. So with no details, we did basically the same thing intuitively as what they've done, uh, but we derived it uh, in a very robust manner and a strong manner. So in the end, we have the same interpretation with a cone, but the cone is not symmetric anymore, uh, which is a consequence of what we derived, but also it's much wider. So it's a much better bound. So if we take, around that, so the, the, the same slide as two slides before, uh, just to show you what we obtain if we take the same points, but use our bound. Now we obtain this. So the region of unreachable F measures are much wider. And more specifically, in this case, we know that whatever we do, we will never go above this point here. This to, I mean, this point actually, which is something like 0 
While currently our best model is 0 0.19, we know that whatever we do, however we move T, however we try, we never get better than 0 0.21. While in previous work, we were basically saying you can still get one. You have to try all these values until uh, you're sure you don't get one. Here we guarantee these 19 values that uh, we don't get more than 0 0.21. So what we, we did then is to say, okay, our bounds are good, so we can use them to actually make an iterative algorithm. So our algorithm is basically as follows. We start with a, a T value that is basically in the middle. So it's what makes sense. We draw the cone of the impossible values, and then we look at the region where it's still possible to get very good values. And we select, for example, this region, and we will create a new, I mean, we'll try with a new T that is in between uh, these two values actually here. And we get T2. We try again. We get a cone. And now the best region to get a, a good F measure would be here. So we will try a T that is right here. And then we get the cone. And so on and so on. The best region might be here. So we'll get a new point that is here and we'll get a cone and so on. So by doing this, we can iteratively try much less cones. I mean, much less T values because this is the main cost of the algorithm, trying T values and find very good regions. Uh, we won't try any more on this region because it's very low, the best. Here probably we won't try very soon and so on. We will try to refine in these regions where there is still something that could be better. Okay, so if you have questions on this first part, which is most of the talk, uh, let me know. Basically, what you have shown is that when we face a highly imbalanced scenario in the supervised setting, we have two options. First one, which consists in performing a positive data augmentation, right? And the second one consists in directly addressing the problem during the learning process either by increasing, for example, the decision boundaries, like you have shown with the gamma uh, uh, nearest neighbor, or by directly optimizing a, a, a good measure like the F measure. Uh, what about the third option consisting in doing nothing? By doing nothing, I mean you just take uh, 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 of the shelf algorithm dedicated uh, usually to optimize the accuracy. But since most of the algorithms have hyperparameters, why, why not just uh, tune these hyperparameters uh, according to, uh, for example, the F measure? Do you think that it's a good idea and, and does it work? Um, so, so without going too far back in the slides, I will use this one uh, to answer this. So here, basically, we are at, by varying T, we are actually tuning one hyperparameter of a weighted, uh, weighted classification learner, so something that learns from a weighted data set. And what we see is that it makes sense. Why we can say that is because we have bounds. Um, but what we also see is that most of the values of the parameters are very bad. So by Doing this, I mean, by trying to do this in this way, uh, it would make sense because it's what we are doing here. Uh, but doing it blindly, actually, like it's done here, or just taking off the shelf algorithm and trying to sample the hyperparameters blindly, uh, we will most of the time fall in very pathological cases when there is a high imbalance. So it's kind of a waste of resources. It, it would work, but it's a huge waste of resources. So here is just an example where it's actually uh, exactly seen here. Okay, uh, there is another question from Loic in the chat. Uh, so the question is about um, sometimes to find anomalies, you try to find holes in the point cloud. So it's, it's uh, in some way uh, what I will present in the second uh, part. Uh, so how does dimensionality enters into play? 
So yeah, it's beneficiary to actually perform dimensionality reduction because uh, when you're in high dimension and a high dimensional space, uh, the fact that there is no points in some region is very ill defined. So it's like the problem I kind of uh, just hinted at some point that KNN is not very good in high dimensions. So uh, most of the methods that will try to find where there is no points are, are also subject subjective to this problem uh, of a high dimension. So reducing the dimensionality is very, uh, very important in this case. And that's partly why representation learning, being it metric learning or deep learning, uh, actually uh, makes a lot of sense to actually transform the data before doing anomaly detection. Okay, so for my last part, uh, that we will just cover very quickly then. Um, just a reminder again, uh, we have supervised uh, anomaly detection, what we've seen for most of the talk. Uh, we have uh, some examples of anomalies, but there are a few of them compared to the normal points. And now we are going to another very different class of problem where we have only normal points we learn from it, or we have only mostly normal points, but we don't know which ones are abnormal. We learn what is normal, and then we will predict from uh, from this. I mean, we will predict from what we've learned as normal. Everything that is different enough will be considered as abnormal. So I will really focus on, uh, on some point. So we, I mean, this point is very important. It's very simple in some sense, but very important. So one very good way to do uh, abnormality detection in an unsupervised manner, so you don't have labels. So you're basically trying to model what is the normal data, is to use the three sigma rule. And basically it says, uh, you will consider one feature of interest, let's make it simple. You just have one feature for your point. You will look at the standard deviation, sigma, and the mean of this feature over all your data sets, or your data set of mostly normal points. And anything that falls behind uh, beyond three sigma, so everything that is farther from the mean of more than three standard deviation, you will consider as an outlier or an anomaly. Uh, there are many improvements that you can do on this, using several features, using some statistics that are better than the mean and the standard deviation, things like this, but. This approach is very at the core of everything that is unsupervised anomaly detection. You model your data and everything that is too different from what you observe, you consider as an, as an anomaly, an outlier, an abnormality, something that is not normal, and so on. So behind this three sigma rule, what we have is actually we supposed a parametric model that explains the data uh, in this case, we suppose that uh, the data comes from a normal distribution. And that's why we had this, uh, this notion of mean and uh, standard deviation. Uh, so we had two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. Then we estimated the parameters from the data. So a uh, not so good way to do it, not so robust, is to take the empirical mean and standard deviation. And then uh, we said that if, so here, so here I plotted, I mean, I took a, a plot of, uh, of the normal distribution. So you, oh, sorry, it's cut a little. So you have the mean here, the mean is here, and the standard deviation is the size of the mean here. So after three standard deviation in a normal distribution, you fall in this region where only it says 0.1% of your data should be. So you would consider that anything that is there is actually uh, some outliers. So really parametric model that is supposed, estimating the parameters, and then, so if the likelihood, so the likelihood is the, basically the height of the curve at this point, if the likelihood is low, or here, if we are far from the mean by more, more than three sigma, then 
uh, we consider that it's an outlier. So it's very fundamental. It's very uh, it's the core of everything that is done. This kind of methods here. All, all this here. Uh, so, so I will still start with this because it's important. I tell you that it's at the core, but there are still different methods. So here I just uh, took something from uh, from Scikit-Learn that shows you different methods to actually uh, do uh, anomaly detection or outlier detection. So robust covariance is basically a 2D version of what I presented. So you suppose that it's normally distributed and you apply the three sigma rules in some case. But there are some other methods, like the, some that will use one class SVM, so support vector machines. Uh, I cannot detail this now, but there is a version that tries to isolate, I mean, that tries to circle uh, the class of interest. Uh, there is also something called isolation forest that will basically say that when you learn a decision tree, uh, randomly actually, uh, a point that is isola isolated, so that is an anomaly, will be easier to separate from the rest by learning a decision tree. So your tree will be simpler, and you use this as a measure of uh, how uh, normal your point is. And there is something that uses uh, KNN in some way to actually uh, compute something that called the local outlier factor that will try to detect anomalies. So I put a link when you would get the slide, you can actually click there. It's a link or just look for scikit learn uh, anomaly detection and you will find this uh, if you want to look at this method. So here, uh, how many, five minutes at most. <laughs> so here, uh, what, what it's basically doing here, and I will skip most of it very fast. It's saying, I will take the simple approach like, okay, I take one feature, but it's more complex than this. I model its distribution, and when whatever is outside of this normal distribution, I will suppose it's an anomaly. Uh, so it's a generalization of this three sigma rule, but what we will do is to have more complex models and uh, more application than just anomaly detection, because when we're doing this, we are learning the geometry, I mean, the distribution of the data, and we can do things with that. We can actually look at this distribution reason about it, and maybe uh, use it to understand our data set and so on. So the modeling, the steps are the same as, uh, as before. And there is a modeling step, which uh, equivalently uh, can be expressed as, as these four sentences. So we define a generative story. So we define how this data is supposed to be generated. In our very simple case, it was supposed to be generated from a normal distribution. Uh, and actually, what is very important is that when we do this, we encode our knowledge, our assumption, or our constraints on the problem. So it's really a modeling activity where we try to, I mean, to encourage the model to have some structure. Okay. Uh, then we fit from the data. We fit. Uh, the parameters of this model, so like finding the mean and the variance in the standard deviation of our normal distribution. Uh, so intuitively, would the data give us some information about the parameters, or we might want sometimes to find just the best parameters of our model, like we've done uh, with the mean and the standard deviation. So there are many usage that we can do. Basically, detecting anomalies is one. Uh, but we can also look at the parameters that will be covered. They might have uh, some meaning depending on what model we propose and so on. So here I go very quickly on this case study and I will conclude uh, with saying nothing, but um, the case study is the following is that we have what we could, uh, I mean, some data that are, uh, that are uh, structured in some temporal document. So basically you have a time axis and some uh, feature axis. And you have the amount of some features across time. And what you want to find is the recurrent patterns that are inside this one. So inside this uh, temporal thing, we see that there is a pattern here, that there is another pattern here, and then one of them is appearing two, two times, the other three times. So what we want to do is actually find when 
the, the, the patterns are occurring, what we call the motifs, and what is the shape of the patterns. So by properly defining a model, much more complex than just a normal distribution, but we can define a model uh, that will properly uh, express this, which is what we observe, as some things that depend on some parameters that are here. And uh, we actually applied, the, I mean, designed this for uh, video processing, so to detect anomalies in videos. So without too much details, uh, we process the videos to extract the motion in the videos. Uh, from this motion, we will actually create some features and the amount of motion of each feature. It's a quantization uh, of the actual motion that we observe. And then we will fit the model so that it best explains our data. And what we recover is some parameters and we can look at these parameters. So these are an actual motif. So temporal patterns that we cover, we recover by fitting a model. And uh, so this, for example, here it's in a, in a traffic scenario. Uh, we see that what is automatically recovered, so the model has no knowledge of a car or anything, but it learns that there is a succession of motions that move this way. And it's actually learning that it's a car. I mean, that uh, it's, a it's a common pattern that we can have. So by doing this, we can actually know that this is normal. So if a car, uh, I don't know, comes here and then makes a U-turn here, if it's never seen before, it won't be in the normal thing. And when we try to actually predict, uh, we'll be out of the three sigma if you want, in a slightly more complex scenario, but out of the three sigma. So this can be applied in different cases. So we skip all these results, but uh, what can be interesting is to see that it has many different uh, applications. One of them is anomaly detection. So we detect things that are abnormal. So here people that are crossing, crossing uh, outside of the zebra, uh, which is actually abnormal in this uh, particular situation. But we can also summarize a lot of data by seeing that there are some patterns that occur and seeing how often they occur across time. Uh, we can do this with some slight supervision a posteriori to actually count some kind of events, some kind of cars going here, or uh, in a project uh, to actually select or pre-select uh, what stream uh, we want to show to an operator that is supposed to actually ensure the safety of uh, public space. So this also works with audio. I won't detail this, but it works pretty well uh, because audio can be represented as uh, time and uh, different things, but uh, it could be spectrograms or here uh, in azimuth uh, information. So I will skip all the details, but basically we do some probabilistic models. So like a normal distribution, but in, in much more complex to ensure that there is some structure. And I will just say that you can do this also with autoencoders, uh, but you need to do things. Uh, and uh, I won't actually talk about it. Okay, so my closing remark is really this one. To do anomaly detection, either you're in a supervised case or in an unsupervised case, but you can also be in the middle where uh, when you do supervised anomaly detection, you still use unsupervised approaches in addition, and you're in case of a semi-supervised approach. We stop here for the sake of time, and uh, I don't know if we take questions more or not. Thank you.